Hello everyone, and welcome to Uncivil Law, where we learn through the misfortunes of others. If you're enjoying this legal education content, please subscribe. It helps the channel go. For today's case, we're dealing number two in our series. This is Roe versus Wade, 1973 U.S. Supreme Court. In this case, a woman wanted the right to have an abortion, which was illegal in most of the states at the time. I believe at the time, if memory serves me correctly, that four states allowed legal abortion. So 46 to not. And yeah, so there, there was a challenge, and this came out of Texas, about whether or not there's a right to abortion. So what did the U.S. Supreme Court have to say about whether there is or is not a right to an abortion? Let's get started with this. This Texas federal appeal and its Georgian companion present constitutional challenges to state criminal abortion legislation. The Texas statutes under attack here are typical of those that have been in effect in many states for approximately a century. We forthwith acknowledge our awareness of the sensitive and emotional nature of the abortion controversy, of vigorously opposing views, even among physicians, and of deep and seemingly absolute convictions that the subject inspires. One's philosophy, one's experience, one exposure to raw edges of human experience, one's religious training, one's attitudes towards life and family and values, and moral standards one establishes and seeks to observe are all likely to influence and color one's thinking and conclusions about the subject of abortion. In addition, population growth, pollution, poverty, and racial overtones tend to compl complicate and not s simplify the problem. Um, so uh, as one of the things here on racial overtones, of course, and this is a little bit less known today, um, but um, let's just say that the history of Planned Parenthood and its founder in particular has some very negative aspects when it comes to uh, black people. And um, yeah, uh, this is not exactly well known on, on the left as much. Um, the founder of Planned Parenthood was um, just a total racist and uh, basically wanted the extermination of black populations. So, yeah, you may not have known that, but uh, the history of uh, Planned Parenthood has uh, some um, very unpleasant origins that are less well known today. So when they're talking about uh, the uh, the racial overtones, they'd be talking about they'd be talking about that. So. There, there, there's that, yeah. Our task, of course, is to resolve the issue by constitutional measurement, free of emotion, good luck with that, and of predilection. We seek earnestly to do this, and because we do, we've inquired into, and in this opinion, place some emphasis upon medical and medicinal legal history, and what history reveals about man's attitude towards, towards abortion procedure over the centuries. We bear in mind, too, Mr. Justice Holmes' admonition in a now vindicated dissent in Lochner. The Constitution is made for people of fundamentally differing views, and the accident of finding certain opinions natural and familiar or novel and even shocking ought not to conclude our judgment upon the question of whether statutes embodying them conflict with the Constitution of the United States. Roe alleged that she was unmarried and pregnant that she wished to terminate her pregnancy by abortion performed by a competent licensed physician under safe clinical conditions, that she was unable to get a legal abortion in Texas because her life did not appear to be threatened by the continuation of the pregnancy, and she could not afford to travel to another jurisdiction or secure a legal abortion under safe conditions. And I believe at the time there were only four states that allowed legal abortions. She claimed that Texas statutes were unconstitutionally vague and they abridged her rights of personal privacy protected by the 1st, 4th, 5th, 9th, and 14th Amendments. By amendment to her complaint, Roe purported to sue on behalf of herself and all other women similarly situated. We are next confronted with issues of judiciability, standing, and abstention. Have Roe and the Does established a personal stake in the outcome of the controversy that ensures the right sought to be adjudicated will be present in an adversary context and in form historically viewed as capable of judicial resolution? So one of the things here that was a big deal is does Roe have standing because by the time this case came about, she was no longer pregnant. So, you know, because, you know, pregnancy only lasts for so long and court cases take longer than that. So the court once again did the standing issue. So the court notes that despite the use of the pseudonym, no suggestion is made that Roe is a fictitious person. For purposes of her case, we accept as true and established her existence, her pregnant state, 
as of inception of her suit in March of 1970, as late of May 21st of that year when she filed the affidavit in the district court. The appellee notes, however, the record does not disclose that Roe was pregnant at the time of the district court hearing on May the 22nd or the following June the 17th when the court's opinion and judgment were filed. And it suggests that Roe's case must now be moot because she and all other members of her class are no longer subject to any 1970 pregnancy because, you know, pregnancy only lasts for nine months. The usual rule in federal cases is that actual controversy must exist at stages of appellate or certiorari review and not simply at the date of action initiated. So, as is well established in federal law, and as we've covered, you must have a live case throughout the entire proceedings. If it stops for any reason, the court case stops. But then the court notes, when, as here, pregnancy is a significant factor in litigation, the normal, 220, the normal 266 day human gestation period is so short, the pregnancy will come to term before the usual appellate process is complete. Very much so. If that termination makes a case moot, Pregnancy litigation seldom will survive much beyond the trial stage. Yeah, trials can last that long for sure. And appellate review will effectively be denied. Our law should not be that rigid. Pregnancy often comes more than once to the same woman and in the general population. If man is to survive, it will always be with us. So yeah, it's like, you know, it may not apply to any particular woman at any given time, but even as the same woman, it may apply in the future and it definitely applies in general. So pregnancy provides a classic justification for continue, for conclusion of a non-mootness, if it could truly be capable of re repetition, but evading review. So this is citing other cases, and this part, this part is not that controversial in and of itself. This idea is an exception to a case being moot. It's like, yeah, if it's capable of constantly coming up, but for some reason it can never get through the process, then that is an exception. Because like, yeah, we need to be able to decide the issue, so we'll, we'll, press past it because there's a standing there for for the group so yeah that's that part is not particularly controversial here in row the principal thrust of the appellant's attack on the texas statues is that they improperly invade a right said to be possessed by pregnant women who choose to terminate their pregnancy appellant would discover this right in concept of personal liberty embodied in the 14th amendment due process clause or in personal, marital, family, and sexual privacy said to be protected by the Bill of Rights or its penumbras, see, for example, Griswold, or among those rights reserved to people by the Ninth Amendment, also citing Griswold. So, yeah, so this is exactly why Griswold is the foundation of Roe. Because Griswold stands for the proposition, which was decided eight years earlier, that married women can get contraception. And its language talked about penumbras and rights beyond the mere rights. So it's like, okay, we've gone from, you have freedom of religion, freedom of speech, freedom of assembly. All right, to you have a derivative right, freedom of association, to you have a derivative right, freedom of privacy, to you have a derivative right, right of contraception, to you have a derivative right, right to an abortion. You see why the conservatives get grumpy over this? It's not just hatred of abortion, which is definitely true among many conservatives. But even from a purely non so you can oppose this as a conservative for religious reasons. You can oppose it for, for doctrinal reasons. So I'm not saying that's not a thing. Don't misunderstand me. There's a lot of reasons for conservatives to oppose this. One of which is that you think that, you know, life is precious and one is religious. And there's a lot of reasons to oppose this. But from a purely, a, a purely theoretical conservative legal philosophy, this is also a problem. Because it's like, yeah, how are you squeezing this language out of the Constitution? And the thing is, you won't find a lot of people, even on the left, who will defend uh, Roe on its own terms. They, they might agree with the result. They might agree that the result is good. But you, you're hard, you'd be hard-pressed to find a lot of people, even on the left side of the aisle, who think that this really is a constitutional reason. Because it's like, it's so derivative, even the left has problems with it from theoretical basis. Now, they kind of are willing to ignore that a little bit because that's more of a left-leaning philosophy, right? Living constitutionalism, adaption. So, like, the left doesn't have as much problem with it and doesn't violate their principles as much because they're more willing to adapt and, and look to times and so forth and so on. But even they won't find it rooted. So, yeah, the conservatives have problems with this for a whole bunch of reasons. Some of it is that, that some of it's religious, some of it's uh, dealing with preservation of life, but even putting that all aside from purely, like, atheistic, atheoretical or a theoretical conservative approach. It's like the conservatives don't like it because it's just not logical 
to find it in the constitutional text. You're having to deal with penumbras of penumbras of penumbras of penumbras. It's like, yeah, somewhere along the line, something didn't make sense to the conservative mindset. It is undisputed at common law, abortion performed before quickening, the first recognizable movement of a fetus in utero, appearing usually from the 16th to 18th week of pregnancy was not an indictable offense. The absence of a common law crime for pre-quickening abortion appears to develop from a confluence of earlier philosophical, theological, and civil and canon law concepts of when life begins. These disciplines variously approach the question in terms of the point at which the embryo or fetus became formed or recognizably human, or in terms of when a person came into being, that is, infused with a soul or animated. A loose consensus evolved in early English law that these events occurred at some point between conception and live birth. And incidentally, this is also con consistent with Islamic law for whatever it's worth. Although Christian philosophy, theology, and canon came to fix the point of animation at 40 days for male and 80 days for female, a vo view that persisted until the 19th century, which I'm not quite sure how at the time you're supposed to know whether it's a male or female. So until it's born, I mean, in the... Uh, 19th century? I don't know how you're supposed to know that, but okay. There otherwise was little agreement about the precise time of formation or animation. There is agreement, however, that prior to this point, the fetus was to be regarded as part of the mother, and its destruction, therefore, was not homicide under the law of the time. Due to the continuing uncertainty of the precise time which animation occurred, to the lack of any empirical data for, data for the 40 to 80 day view, which, you know, wasn't based on any sort of, you know, scientific reality, and perhaps due to Aquinas' definition of movement as one of the first two principles of life, the prior focus on quickening as a critical point, which is the point where the, the child moves inside. The significance of quickening was echoed later by common law scholars and found its way into revised common law in this country. So this is a very fair point about the law as it relates to when a child, when the soul attached. This is consistent with early Christian theology. This is consistent with early, and as to my understanding, although I'm no Islamic expert, this is consistent with modern uh, Islamic uh, philosophy as well. Um, so the Christian church might have moved on this, but uh, to my understanding, Islamic philosophy has not moved. Now, I forget exactly what it is in the Islamic faith, but it's something around that 40, 80 day mark. That sounds right off the top of my head. Um, but yeah, in the, in the Christian uh, philosophy until the, until the 19th century, they weren't, uh, they didn't see it as a human being until quickening which is the time that the child moved, which is around the 14th, 18th week, something along those lines. So yeah, uh, the, the, early tr the early Christian philosophy, um, even up to the 18th century, didn't see this as a, a person worthy of independent um, uh, sovereignty. Now, of course, that's not really based on anything in terms of hard thought or hard science. So the philosophy has moved, but that is reflective of the, the philosophy at the time. England's first criminal abortion statute, the Lord Edelborough Act, came into being in 1803. It made abortion of a quick fetus, which is to say one that is moving, again, we discussed that, like 14th, 18th weeks period, a capital crime. But in Section 2, it provided lesser penalties for felony abortion before quitting and thus preserved that distinction. So the first criminal statutes make it a, made it a crime to abort at any period, but only made it a capital offense if it happened after the child was already quickened, which is to say as for an independent life as far as the English law at the time was concerned. As to the American law in this country, the law in effect in all but a few states until the mid-19th century was that the same of pre-existing English common law. Connecticut, the first state to enact an abortion legislation of its own, adopted then for 1821 that part of the Lord Edinburgh Act that referred to as a woman quick with child. This is also, incidentally, in case you're wondering where the phrase the quick and the dead comes from, from the movie. You've ever heard the phrase the quick and the dead? Why they call it quick? Because that's another meaning for living. So the quick and the dead could just be retold the living and the dead. So there you go. Now you, now you have that mystery solved from early uh, cinema. Why is it called the quick and the dead? Because quick is another name for living. Now you know. Yay. The death penalty was not imposed. Abortion before quickening was made a crime in the state only in 1860. In 1828, the New York enacted legislation that, in two respects, was to serve as a model for early anti-abortion statutes. First, while barring destruction of an unquickened fetus, as well as a quick fetus, it made the former only a misdemeanor, but the latter a second-degree manslaughter. 
Second, it incorporated a concept of therapeutic abortion by providing that abortion was excused if it shall be necessary to preserve the life of the mother or shall have been advised by two physicians to be necessary for a such purpose. By 1840, when Texas had received, received the common law, only eight states had statutes dealing with abortion. It was not until after the war between the states that legislatures began to replace the common law with more specific statutory ones. Gradually, in the middle and late 19th centuries, the quickening distinction disappeared from the statutory law of most states, and the degree of offense and penalties were increased. By the end of the 1950s, a large majority of jurisdictions had banned abortion, however, and wherever performed unless done to save or preserve the life of the mother. The exceptions, Alabama and District of Columbia, permitted abortion to preserve the mother's health. So ironically enough, Alabama at the time was one of the most progressive states when it came to this subject. Alabama, leader in abortion rights. There you go. Three states permitted abortions that were not unlawfully performed or were not without lawful justification, leaving the standards of the court. So, yeah, those were four states. Um, and I try to remember that I believe one of the others was Alaska. I want to say Alaska was one. And I think Washington State and maybe Illinois were the other ones. But, yeah, there were only four states at the time that led the way. And and the one, and two of those states were the progressive states of Alabama and Alaska. Yeah. Who knew, right? Yeah, they were leading the charge in abortion rights. Alabama and Alaska. Yeah. And you know who was opposing abortion rights at the time? Connecticut. Leading the charge for abortion rights, Alabama and Alaska. Not approving of abortion, Connecticut. Yeah. It thus became apparent at common law at the time of adoption of our Constitution that throughout a major portion of the 19th century, abortion was viewed with less disfavor than under most American statutes currently in effect. Phrasing it another way, a woman enjoyed a substantially broader right to terminate a pregnancy than she does in most states today. At least with respect to early stages of pregnancy and very possibly without limitation, the opportunity to make this choice was present in the country well until the 19th century. A year later, the law, therefore, for some time, began to treat less punitively an abortion procured in early pregnancy. The anti-abortion mood prevalent in this country as late in the 19th century was shared by medical professionals. Indeed, attitude of this profession may have played a significant role in the enactment of stringent criminal abortion legislation that was later passed. Okay, so I have a couple thoughts about this that are a little bit interesting. So it's interesting to talk about the common law history, about some of the, the attitudes towards abortion, and also compare it with other attitudes to other things. Because criminal laws change, and the one example that comes to mind, and I'm not sure exactly why it comes to mind, and forgive me if you find the example inappropriate, but another example that comes to mind is like regulation around marijuana. Um, there wasn't a lot dealing with that at, until, you know, the early 20th century. So I don't know if it's exactly fair to compare the two, but one could make at least a colorable analogy between abortion and other things that became illegal later. So it's like, okay, well, at the time of the Constitution's founding, abortion wasn't really illegal or it wasn't contemplated or it was more open than it was that became later. So it's like, okay, if you accept the premise that abortion was more open at the time and therefore somehow baked into the constitution, if you accept that premise, then you could at least ask that question for other things. Like when it came to, I mean, any number of things, alcohol regulation, marijuana regulation, food safety regulations, drug regulations in general, I mean, lest we forget that heroin was officially a product by bear at one point, sold by doctors. So, like, I, I mean, I don't, I don't know exactly where that logic goes or doesn't go. So, if you don't buy it, I understand. But there's something, there's something slightly incomplete here. It's like, yeah, it wasn't really illegal at the time, but does that prevent it from becoming illegal later? And if so, like, how does that apply to other things? And does that, in a, how does that relate to any number of regulations, gun regulations or any other regulations which were different at the time? What else is baked into the constitutional guarantee? Hopefully some of that made sense in terms of my point. So hopefully you were able to derive my point somewhere in there. So I, this is something I think about. I don't know if anything I just said made any sense. Did anything I just say make any sense at all? Was it completely incoherent or was somewhere in there a point that people understood? <laughs> did, any, 
Did any of that make any sense? In 1871, a long and vivid report was submitted to the Committee of Criminal Abortion. It ended with this observation. We have to deal with human life. In a matter of less importance, we could entertain no compromise. An honest judge on the bench would have to call things by their proper names. We could do no less. A proffered resolution among the association recommending, among other things, that would be unlawful and unprofessional for any physician to induce abortion or premature labor without the concurrent opinion of at least one respectable consulting physician, and then always with view of safety of the child, if possible, and calling the attention of clergy of all denominations to the perverted views of morality entertained by a large class of females, I and men also on this important question. So the American Medical Association at the time, the AMA doctors said that the that the views of morality entertained by a large class of females was perverted and, and men too. So you know who opposed abortion? The American Medical Association. They thought the physicians should be prohibited and they thought that the 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 large class of females had perverted medical views. So the AMA opposed it, but Alabama was all about it. So, you know, eh. Three reasons have been advanced to explain historically the enactment of criminal abortion laws in the 19th century and to justify their continued ex existence. It has been argued occasionally that these laws were the product of Victorian social concerns to discourage illicit sexual conduct. So there, there have been multiple reasons why abortion has been banned. Okay, so what are these multiple reasons abortion has been banned? Okay, reason number one, to discourage illicit sex, which is to say discourage sex. So we don't want people to have sex or we want them only to do it in marriage. Okay, great. So that's one reason. Texas, however, does not advance this particular justification. And it appears that no court or commentator has taken this argument seriously. So the we don't want to have people to have sex argument was not bought, apparently, by anyone. The appellants and the amici contend, however, that this is not a proper state purpose at all and suggest that if Texas were to have this as overbroad protecting, since it fails to distinguish between married and unwed mothers. So, yeah, the, the, it, one of the reasons abortion should be bad is because if abortion was legal, more people might have illicit sex because they could have abortions, and that would be bad. So we want to prevent people from having abortions so they'll not have sex. One can query about how successful that would be or otherwise. But uh, in any case, uh, no one is advancing that proposition at this point. So Texas isn't saying that's the reason. We don't want to have people have sex. Okay, so we're going to dismiss that one out of hand. All right, what's, what else do we have? A second reason is concerned with ab abortion as a medical procedure. When most criminal abortion laws were first enacted, the procedure was hazardous one for women, which, you know, fair enough. Uh, at the time, the medical technology was not particularly great, so there, there's definitely that to be had. Even, and I mean, I mean, before antibiotics were invented in particular, I mean, gee, you know, Lord, any kind of infection was basically fatal. So, yeah, even as of 1900 and perhaps until the development of antibiotics in the 1940s, standard medical techniques such as dilation and were, were not safe as they are today. So there's that. Thus, it's been argued state's real concern in enacting criminal abortion laws was to protect the pregnant woman. That is to restrain her from submitting to a procedure that placed her life in serious jeopardy. Which, you know, at that point in history is a colorable argument. However, the court notes that at the time of this in 1973, most medical techniques have altered this situation. The appellants. Modern medical techniques have altered this situation. The appellants and various amici refer to medical data indicating that abortion in early pregnancy, that is, prior to the end of a woman's first trimester, although not without risk, is relatively safe, and even more so today. Because uh, this is 1973, so now 50 years later, even more so. Morality rates for women undergoing early abortions when the procedure is legal appears to be as low or lower than rates for a normal childbirth, which at the time was somewhat higher than it is now, of course. Consequently, any interest of the state in protecting the women from an inherently dangerous procedure, except where it would be equally dangerous for her to forego it, has largely disappeared. Of course, important state interests in the arena of health and medical standards remain. The state has a legitimate interest in seeing to that abortion, like any other medical procedure, is performed under circumstances that ensure maximum safety for the patient. So that's a valid concern as it is today, and states definitely try to regulate it around this area, perhaps too much so, depending on your point of view, but making sure that it's safe is a legitimate concern. The third reason is the state's interest. Some phrase it in terms of duty in protecting prenatal life, which is definitely the dominant one that is dominant today. 
So this is the one that people argue about alive. It's like, we need to protect life. Some argument of this justification rests on the theory that a new human life is present from the moment of conception, which, you know, is a reasonable perspective because when does life begin is a colorable argument. And if you want to go all the way of contraception, that's a logically tenable view. Um, of course, it wasn't a view held at the early common law as we held, but it would be a colorable view, at least. The state's interest and general obligation to protect life then extends to prenatal life, which would be a tenable conclusion. Only when life of the pregnant mother herself is at stake, balanced against the life she carries, should that interest of the embryo or fetus not prevail. Which, again, is a colorable interest even today. And I don't know anyone who disagrees with this as far as life of the mother is concerned. There might be someone somewhere because, you know, you can never you can never go too far. But I I think even pretty diehard. And this is also like even consistent with Catholicism. It's like even in, even in Catholicism, it's like if if the mother needs to do a procedure to save herself, it's acceptable, even if it will cause harm to the, to the child, because it's a second order consequence. Right. So the intent is not to harm the child. The intent is to save the mother. So even under Catholic doctrine today, if you are if you had I mean, the situation would be for lack of a better description, suppose you had to give chemo to a woman. I, I'm just to pick it out of example. Suppose you had to give chemo to a woman and and it would kill the child. Under Catholic doctrine, that would be acceptable because the, the harm to the child is a second order consequence. It's not the intention. And um, from classic conservative theory, like threat, threat of death by anybody is reason of self-defense. So this would be self-defense theory would be consistent with it. I mean, if you as a full grown damn adult pose a threat of death to me, I can take action against you, even if you're not intending that. So like under self-defense theory 101, if you're posing imminent threat of death, I can take action to preserve myself, even if you're not intending that result. So under, under that theory, like if a fetus is posing threat of death, then under self-defense theory, you're there. So this is consistent with Catholic doctrines, consistent with self-defense doctrine, but it, that would be in the case of threat of what you call death or grievous bodily harm. So it wouldn't even necessarily have to be death grievous bodily harm. And then we could have a discussion about what that is, but that'd be consistent with self-defense doctrine. So there you go as to that. Logically, of course, a legitimate state interest in this area need not stand or fall on acceptance of belief that life begins at conception or some other point prior to live birth. So yeah, so a state interest doesn't need to rise or fall based on this. It's a valid consideration, but it's not a the only basis. In asserting the state interest, recognition may be given to a less rigid claim that as long as a potential life is involved, the state may assert interest beyond protection of the pregnant woman alone. So you don't even necessarily need to conclude it is a life, although that's possible. Maybe potential life is enough as a justification for state action, at least theoretically. So that's a valid consideration that needs to be balanced among other considerations. So how does the court factor that in? The Constitution does not explicitly mention any right of privacy, which it doesn't. And so trying to factor abortion into a right of privacy makes the conservatives kind of grumpy because we're not really sure about the right of privacy in the first place. It's like maybe you can squeeze out a right of privacy in there somewhere, but to to get that far and then to go beyond that to abortion, it's like you're asking a lot of a conservative. It's like we're not really sold on the privacy thing in the first place. We definitely recognize the first, third, fourth, fifth, ninth amendments, among others, but... The generalized right of privacy, the conservatives are not quite sold. And if we get that far to then go to abortion as part of that right of privacy, it's like you're asking a lot for conservative legal thinking. The court has recognized a personal right of privacy or guarantee of certain areas of zone of privacy does exist under the Constitution. In varying contexts, the court or individual justices have found the roots in the right of the First Amendment, the Fourth and Fifth Amendments. Uh, the pursuit in the penumbra of bill of rights which makes those conservatives very grumpy in the ninth amendments or the concept of liberty in the first section of the 14th amendment these decisions make clear that only personal rights can be deemed fundamental or implicit in the order of liberty and are included in this guarantee of personal privacy they also make it clear the right has some extensions to activities relating to marriage procreation contraception and family relationships and child rearing and education so yeah i mean again you Again, when you're talking about conservatives as a block, much like when you're talking about the left as a block, which my chat seems to really hate it when I do, which I understand why. But it's like, yeah, if you're talking about conservatives as a block, it's like, where do you draw these lines and where don't you? Conservatives disagree. 
as liberals do. So when you talk about the right as a block or the left as a block, obviously you have to talk about them in big swaths. But yeah, some some conservatives will go hardcore, like Justice Thomas or Justice Black. Some are a little bit less so. I'm definitely not as hardcore as Black. I respect him. I understand it. But it's too it's too much for my taste, right? I wouldn't go that far, um, especially when it comes to precedent and stuff like that. But yeah, some of this makes sense as principles, and some of it doesn't. It's like when you're going to first order when you go into first order principles as a conservative. But it's like, yeah, where are you? How far you're willing to stretch that? And it's like, yeah, somewhere along the line. It became very uncomfortable. And maybe there are conservatives that would go this far. I'm not saying that conservatives can't go this far. But for a lot of conservatives, it's like, yeah, you're built you're built on the, like, you're like four orders deep. You went from the First Amendment to a right of association, to a right of privacy, to a right of abortion. It's like you're four orders deep. For some conservatives, I think for a lot of conservative legal thinking, that's like, that's too much, man. That, somewhere along that line didn't quite make sense. The right of privacy, whether it be founded in the 14th Amendment conception of personal liberty and restrictions upon state action, as we feel it is, or as the district court determined in the Ninth Amendment reservation of rights, is broad enough to encompass a woman's decision whether or not to terminate the pregnancy. Yeah, see, this again is where the conservatives kind of get off the train. It's like, even if we can get to right of privacy in the 14th Amendment and personal liberty, which, yeah, you could probably get that far, even if you can get it into the Ninth Amendment reservation of rights, it's like, yeah, maybe we can get that far. To go to the next step of abortion is it's broad enough to encompass the right to terminate a pregnancy. The conservatives are like, yeah. I mean, again, you, you, you'd you be hard-pressed to find a lot of people who, who agree with this on first principle, even on left legal thinking. Now, again, left legal thinking has less problem because they're willing to be living constitutionalists about it, but you find a hard time finding people who really think that when the Ninth Amendment was written or the 14th Amendment was written, they really were contemplating a right to abortion in that somewhere. It's like, you know, that's asking a lot. That's squeezing a lot out of language. Even if you can get to privacy as a concept, it's a little amorphous. So maybe they were contemplating privacy, but abortion? I mean, if if be hard pressed to find many legal scholars today who would agree with this, I think. On the basis of elimination such as these, appellant and some amici argue that women's right is absolute and she's entitled to terminate her pregnancy whenever time, in whatever way, and for whatever reason she chooses. With that, we do not agree. So the Supreme Court said not for all possible purposes. That's too much, which is an interesting concept if you're baking in the right of privacy, because why shouldn't you be able to have all the privacy, but whatever. The court's decision recognizing a right of privacy also acknowledged that some state regulation in areas protect a right that's appropriate. As noted above, a state may properly assert important interest in safeguarding health, in maintaining medical standards, and in protecting potential life. At some point in pregnancy, these respective interests become sufficiently compelling to sustain regulation of factors that govern an abortion decision. The privacy right involved, therefore, cannot be said to be absolute. We therefore conclude the right of personal privacy includes the abortion decision, but this right is not unqualified and must be considered against important state interests in regulation. This conclusion, however, does not fully answer the contentions raised by Texas, and we pass on to other considerations. The pregnant woman cannot be isolated in her privacy. She carries an embryo and later a fetus, if one accepts medical definitions of a young in the human uterus. The situation, therefore, is inherently different from marital intimacy or bedroom possession of obscene material or marriage or procreation or education, which the prior case law respectively concerned. As we've intimated above, it's reasonable and appropriate for a state to decide at some point in time another's interest that the health of the mother or that of potential life becomes significantly involved. The woman's privacy is no longer soul, and any right privacy she protests must be measured accordingly. So maybe there's another person or interest that might have to be factored in here. Texas urges, apart from the 14th Amendment, life begins at conception and is present throughout pregnancy, and therefore the state has a compelling interest in protecting that life from and after conception. We need not resolve difficult questions of when life begins. When those trained in respective disciplines of medicine, philosophy, and theology are unable to arrive at any consensus, the judiciary at this point in development of man's knowledge is not in a position to speculate the answer. In view of all this, we do not agree that, by adopting one theory of life, Texas may override the right of pregnant women that are at stake. We repeat, however, that the state does have a legitimate and important interest in preserving and protecting the health of pregnant women, whether she be the resident of the state or a non-resident who seeks medical consultation and treatment therein. 
and that still has another important and legitimate interest in protecting the potential of human life. These interests are separate and distinct. Each grows in substantiality as a woman approaches term, and at a point in the pregnancy, each becomes compelling. With respect to important and legitimate interest in the health of the mother, the compelling point in light of medical knowledge is approximately the end of the first trimester. This is so because of a now established medical fact referred to above that until the end of the first trimester, mortality in abortion may be less than mortality in trial birth. It follows them after this point, a state may regulate abortion procedure to the extent that regulation relies on preservation and protection of health. So in Roe versus Wade, and this will be changed later in Casey, which we'll get to in a later case, but Roe versus Wade, they are measuring the risk of health to the mother from having the pregnancy versus having the abortion. So the, the state, so the Supreme Court at this point in 1973 is saying at early stages, the risk of abortion is less than the risk of having the child go on. And so there's a, so it's a medical waiting, which is the greater risk. So at this point, the, the Supreme Court says, well, up till the end of the first trimester at last, at least the abortion is safer. So the woman could have the abortion because there's no interest in the state of regulating it because if they're looking out for the safety of the mother, then it would be safer for the woman to have an abortion. So that logic doesn't flow. Now that of course presumes that you think that that's the valid consideration which Texas doesn't agree with, incidentally, here. The Texas thinks that life of the child is also relevant, but the Supreme Court at this point is talking only about the relative risk to the mother, not about the life of the child, So, which seems a little bit weird from the antecedent, but that's what the Supreme Court is writing about. That means, on the other hand, that for the period of pregnancy prior to this compelling point, the attending physician, in consultation with the patient, is free to determine, without regulation by the state, that in medical judgment, the patient's pregnancy should be terminated. If that decision is reached, the judgment may be effectuated by abortion free of interference. With respect to the state's important and legitimate interest in potential life, the compelling point is viability, which it's not clear why the Supreme Court says that exactly. This is so because the fetus then has presumption of capability of meaningful life outside the mother's womb. But we were talking about potential life, so why was it not potential before that point? Because we're talking about potential. Hmm. State regulation protective of fetal life after viability thus has logical and biological justifications. If the state interest in protecting fetal life after viability, it may go so far as to proscribe, which is to forbid, abortion during that period, except when it's necessary to preserve life or health of the mother. So that is our end of our discussion of Roe versus Wade, a decision as controversial today as it is when the day it was decided. The Supreme Court bases this decision in the right of privacy, which it finds based derivative of the right of association, which it finds derivative of the First Amendment. And yeah, there's not a lot of people who would agree with this on its own terms. Now, there's a whole ton of people who will agree that abortion is is a good thing and should be legal. But there's not a lot of people who I've found who will actually defend this on its own terms because the Supreme Court's logic doesn't quite uphold. Now, from a position of precedence, from a position of reliance, from a position of expectations, from a position of what's fundamentally good, again, a lot of people defend this. But trying to find people who defend this on its own terms is a little bit hard these days because it's a little bit um, reaching at a bare minimum. And it's not clear why, if you think potential life is valuable, why that only applies after viability. Because presumably it's potential before, but that's what the Supreme Court wrote. So I don't know what, they, what to tell you, except that's what the Supreme Court wrote. And that brings us to the end of the coverage of this case. Thank you so much for being part of the Uncivil Law family. If you enjoyed this legal education content, please hit the subscribe button. It really helps the channel grow. We appreciate your continuing support. And until later, my friends, cheers and goodbye.